Yeah. yeah. So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, uh, let's get going. Uh, we start. Uh, we have three more uh, talks in the morning, before noon. That is, and we'll start with uh, Sophia Jepson's talk. She's at the Department of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Study at Umeå University, or something like that. Uh, I tried to pronounce it rightly. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Sophia. And uh, yeah, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you. So this talk is titled Exemption, Self-Exemption and the Compassionate Self-Excuse. And uh, as I have been working on this project, uh, it has gradually become more personal with more personal examples from my own life. So uh, yeah, be prepared for this. Um, and uh, like, sorry, I, right, no. I had some trouble switching slides for some reason. Okay, so like more and see before me, I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about this Strawsonian tradition in moral responsibility, uh, where you distinguish between excuses and exemptions and between the objective and participant attitudes we can take to other people. Uh, so if you're excused for some wrongdoing, then we still see you as a member of the moral community. Uh, you still, you're still a participant in normal human relationships, normal human moral relationships, but you are excused this time because there are these textbook examples, like I stepped hard on someone's foot, but it wasn't out of ill will. It was because I slipped on a patch of ice and lost my balance or something, so I'm excused. Uh, I played loud music all night, so my neighbor couldn't sleep, but I thought for understandable reasons that he was on vacation, uh, so I'm excused and so on. And then we have exemptions, uh, where you consider someone, uh, not just momentarily, but more generally too out of control or too irrational or too unintelligent to be a morally responsible person in the first place. And um, so relating to a little discussion with uh, Morin C, uh, I mean, this is exactly how Strawson describes this. Uh, we exempt uh, children, hopeless schizophrenics, the warped and deranged, uh, people who are unfit for normal relationships, uh, these people are to be managed and handled, cured or trained in our interests in societies or even their own. This is exactly how he puts it. And these people, they may give rise to some emotional reactions, to fear and repulsion, which I try to draw uh, the person on the left here, or pity, patting on the head, even some kinds of love, but, but obviously not the kind of love that two adults can reciprocally feel for each other because that's not for mad people. And uh, uh, so Strawson here like describes what it takes to be our moral responsibility practices, uh, but also endorses them because it says, this is how civilized people react to those who are warped and deranged. Um, and um, this is not just obviously Strawson's paper. Uh, this paper did not only give rise to a moral philosophical tradition that I'm sympathetic with in the general uh, free will and moral responsibility discussion where you focus more on relationships and sentiments than on metaphysics, uh, but also to a tradition on how to regard uh, mad people, uh, that they ought to be exempted uh, because you can't relate to them and so on. Uh, a tradition which I'm less sympathetic to, which is still alive and kicking in moral philosophy. And obviously these are also ideas that are widespread, that were widespread outside of philosophy when he wrote the paper in 1962, that are still widespread outside of philosophy. And so I think there are a lot of problems with the idea that when someone is mad, then we stop seeing them as participants in normal relationships 
and instead put them in this objective box where they are only to be managed and handled and at best pitied. Um, so first problem is that in theory, there is an upside to this, which is that when you're regarded objectively, uh, you are protected against blame and punishment. Uh, but in reality, that's not even true. Um, so uh, there is empirical research showing that when we see someone as irrational, warped and deranged, this often makes our punitive responses stronger. Uh, and we see this uh, with uh, certain minority groups like Aboriginal people in Australia or Black people in the United States. Uh, they are stereotyped as being irrational, as being out of control, and simultaneously seen as more blameworthy for bad behavior. And the Black kids are considered fully morally responsible for bad things they do at a much younger age than white kids. Uh, and I think it is problematic for a number of reasons uh, if people mistakenly think that our psychology works the way Strawson and uh, his uh, followers in moral philosophy claim they work. If they mistakenly think that when you are regarded as irrational and deranged, this offers protection against blame and punishment when in reality it doesn't or at least often doesn't. Uh, so, so this is not an objection to someone who wants to argue that we should revise our moral responsibility practices and begin to stop blaming people when they are seen as irrational and out of control. It's an objection to people who think that uh, this is how we already function psychologically and we can like proceed from that. Uh, then uh, the second problem, which I'm going to mention more briefly, uh, is that uh, being regarded objectively isolates you. When people see you this way, they stop listening to what you say. Uh, so they, don't, they no longer take in the content of what you say. Uh, instead, uh, uh, when you try to argue with people, all they hear are like, uh, mental illness symptoms, illness noises coming out of your mouth, uh, which uh, is obviously very isolating and problematic. Uh, but uh, what I will focus on is um, how to regard myself. Because moral philosophy that deals with uh, exemption or moral responsibility for mad people, they always speak of mad people in the third person. So texts are written, talks are held uh, from the um, implicit assumption that we philosophers, we who write and read philosophical texts, we who go to philosophy seminars, we are obviously all of us sane. And now we're going to discuss what to do when we sane philosophers meet a mad person somewhere out there outside of the university? Should we exempt them more or less? Should we regard them objectively? And I think this is no um, accident, so to speak. It's not like in all the philosophical texts uh, where there is sort of this implicit assumption that all philosophers and everyone who reads the philosophical text is male, because that's an assumption that you can change without changing the way you talk about the philosophical issues themselves. Uh, but the, it, it goes more deep, this assumption that uh, mad people are out there, other people that we, the sane ones, must find some way to relate to. Uh, because when you look at exemption, uh, exemption from taking up an objective attitude, this is something that you cannot apply to yourself, only to other people. Excuses you can clearly apply to yourself. Uh, if I slip on a patch of ice and accidentally step hard on someone's foot, uh, or if I play like loud music all night and disturb my neighbor because I mistakenly thought he wasn't at home, then I can excuse myself. There is no problem that I can tell myself that 
uh, it wasn't my fault, uh, I didn't know or something. But exemptions can't so easily be applied to oneself and that's what I will focus on. Uh, so I will kind of divide uh, what uh, Strawson says about exemptions in, in two parts and first focus on the hopeless part. Uh, so he talks about hopeless schizophrenics and I might try to exempt myself uh, by telling myself that, well, uh, I'm just a hopeless schizophrenic, I couldn't help it, or I'm just a hopeless bipolar or hopeless schizoaffective or hopeless something else, uh, whichever diagnosis I happen to have. Uh, and I, when I use the word hopeless here, I mean in particular that I I can't control myself and maybe I also cannot think properly. I'm in that sense hopeless. I'm hopelessly out of control. I'm hopelessly beyond reason and therefore I should be exempted. Uh, and now during the work with, with this paper and you know people have read it and commented on it, uh, it's been pointed out to me and that's fair enough. Uh, the Strawson never says and most moral philosophers would not say that in order to be exempted, you have to be 100% out of control. I mean, it's sufficient that you fall below some kind of moral responsibility threshold, that you fall below some kind of threshold for uh, control over what you're doing, reasons, responsiveness, stuff like that. But uh, there is no easy way first to define this threshold. Uh, Fisher and Ravisa, they talk about moderate reasons, responsiveness, and so on. There is this kind of stuff in the literature, but these uh, definitions, if you even want to call them that, are, are still very vague. Uh, and even if I knew exactly what moderate reasons, responsiveness meant, and that this is what is required to be morally responsible for what I do, uh, it's hard to see how I could, via introspection, find out whether I uh, fall a little below or a little above this moderate reasons responsiveness. And we also see in real life that when people try to tell themselves that they were not guilty of some bad thing they did, uh, that they were not responsible because of some mental disorder, some diagnosis they have, uh, they tend not to talk about being uh, a little too irrational or a little too unresponsive to reasons to be morally responsible, but the discussions tend to be more black and white. And people tend to say things that, but this wasn't me, this was because of the mental disorder, or this is not something one can help. It wasn't my fault, I couldn't help it. I have this diagnosis and talk more in these hopeless terms, like I can't help it at all. Uh, but at the same time, this is a picture of myself, which can very well be hard to sustain if it clashes with my experiences and memories of uh, deliberating, choosing what to do, acting on, the cho acting on this choice, uh, and uh, overall exercising my agency. And I'm not going to say that everyone with some kind of mental disorder always have agency to exercise. Uh, so when you're in psychosis, you can have these uh, strong passivity experiences where it's really as if uh, some alien entity took over your body and they control it like a puppet. Uh, I haven't had exactly this experience myself, but it's an experience that some people have had. Um, people with serious depression have talked about how it's completely knocked them out and they feel literally unable to move and just lie there. But a lot of the time, uh, for a lot of mental disorders, and even when you're actively psychotic, you do experience that you have still some agency. 
And that makes it hard to convince yourself that actually you were hopeless, you couldn't think at all, and you had no control over what you were doing when that is not what you remember. Um, and so uh, this is a picture which is supposed to be me being scared of a demon coming out of the mirror. And even in this situation, where you're sort of mad with a capital M, so it's not just a little anxiety or something that people tend to be dismissive of as, oh, we all struggle with that from time to time. But now we're talking more like capital M madness, being afraid of demons. Uh, but even so, first of all, I've experienced that uh, there is a kind of mental action where you either cling really hard to the idea that uh, these are just hallucinations and this is just psychosis, uh, this is not real, and actively use willpower to cling really hard to, so to speak, standard reality. And this takes a lot of effort, so at some point you might go, screw this, I can't do this anymore, I'm going mad now. But, and, and that, is, that is a choice made under immense pressure. It is not at all like the choice of, oh, screw this, I can't grade any more essays tonight, I'm going to the movies. It is not like that. Uh, it is more um, like, this is the analogy I came up with, uh, you're about to be swept away by a river, but you've managed to grab hold of a tree branch that hangs out over the river. So you're like holding on to the branch, you're trying to pull yourself up, but it's really, really hard and your arms get more and more tired and they begin to burn with lactic acid and eventually you go, screw this, I'm going down the river, I'm taking my chances in the river. So it's a choice made under immense pressure, not a paradigm free and voluntary choice but still a choice and a kind of mental action. And then once you've sort of jumped into the river and you're like, okay, demons wanna kill me, what should I do about it? There can still be like choices you make uh, about trying to flee, trying to protect yourself in some way. And so when thinking back on one of these episodes and uh, one thing I have felt guilty about which I have done uh, numerous times, is uh, going home to some friend I trust and trying to hide that from the demons pursuing me and kind of wanting this friend to save me. And, you know, obviously dragging up people up in the middle of the night can be pretty hard on them and rob them of sleep and mess up their studies or work life. And so this is something I felt guilty of. And um, now when people do feel guilty about stuff they have done when psychotic, because obviously I'm not the only one this has happened to, they are often told by psychiatrists or by peers in support groups who repeat what their own psychiatrists have told them, that you should not feel guilty because when you're psychotic, you're completely out of control. But it's just hard to buy that I should completely exempt myself from responsibility on these grounds when my experience was not like that. And uh, there has been some recent research um, and interview studies of people with experience with psychosis uh, that suggests that this is actually a pretty common experience that you still experience the kind of agency that I have just described, that you're making choices, you're actively choosing what to do and acting on your choices and under immense stress and pressure, but you still have this agency left. And then you might feel guilty about the choices you made and it's just hard to buy the claim that you should not feel guilty because actually you were completely out of control because that is not what it seemed like at the time. Um, so an alternative method might be to employ what I maybe a little dismissively to poor Dirk, who's uh, really a very nice guy, call a philosophical trick for pumping non-responsibility intuitions. 
and that is taking up a causal perspective. Uh, so Doug Peerbaum, he doesn't write about um, issues of mental disorders or madness. Uh, he uh, writes about moral responsibility in general. But he's got this thought experiment employed in, in that philosophical debate uh, where Professor Plum kills Miss White uh, and then he describes uh, the causes behind Plum killing White. And Plum is stipulated to be fully rational and so on. He is not, uh, as Strawson put it, warped and deranged when he does this. Uh, he has um, contemplated his reasons for murder, which are selfish ones, he stands to gain from it, and he commits the murder. Uh, but in different versions of this thought experiment, uh, Plum is said to have been programmed by scientists somehow, they programmed his brain uh, to become selfish and deliberate in the selfish way that he does and so on. Uh, and in another version of the thought experiment, he grew up in a community that highly valued a kind of rational selfishness and therefore he acquired these values and so on. And these descriptions that really make us focus on the causes behind his action makes most readers feel, including me, that he cannot be responsible for the murder. Um, and uh, this, <laughs> I want to stress, it's a feeling, it's an intuition, uh, but it is a, a pretty strong one. You look at this causal chain where one thing led to the other, and it just looks like a chain of events. It is what it is. There is nothing here to judge. And this kind of trick is sort of used by people in real life trying to escape feelings of guilt and blame from others uh, when they have some kind of diagnosis. Uh, like maybe you share this meme, there are some different versions with the brain pictures where they have different colors depending on your diagnosis. And, uh, you know, I, I think we all know that it's got something to do with how much activity there is in different parts of the brain. But I'd say most of us don't know anything more than that. Um, and yet, like people look at these pictures and um, apparently feel uh, some liberation from guilt, at least temporarily. It's like, yeah, I did that because my brain was blue and, and not like uh, blue teal and orange, like it's supposed to be like the normal brain in the middle. And, and this uh, blue brain caused me to act the way I did or whatever. Um, it, people talk about neurotransmitters causing uh, mental disorders, which in turn cause behavior. Alternatively, one might identify a mental disorder with some imbalance in the neurotransmitters and say more directly that the imbalance causes behavior. Uh, and in all in all, you take a step back from your life and from your experiences and try to paint a picture of yourself as this causal system, as almost a kind of mechanical system where input gives output. One event leads to the next event, leads to behavior. And you get this feeling when you do that, that it is what it is. There is nothing here to judge. And, and I should stress that neurological explanations of behavior does not in any way prove that I lacked agency and control and was non-responsible for that reason. If there is a neurological explanation of my behavior, that in itself does not tell us whether the neurological stuff caused me to exercise my agency in this way or caused me to completely out of control act in this way. Uh, I mean, just pointing to a neurological explanation doesn't uh, say anything about 
how much agency I had and so on. But even, and that's why I call it a kind of philosophical trick for escaping guilt and blame, because it's, it's not really an argument for anything. It doesn't prove anything, but by thinking about ourselves as these causal systems where input gives output, uh, we were did what we did because we were caused to, we can sort of feel guilt uh, flow off us. But um, so here's the problem with this though, that it will necessarily be very fragile and unstable because you can sit down and contemplate and think about yourself in this way as a causal system. It is what it is. There is nothing to judge. Uh, but you know, you can't spend your life sitting and comp contemplating. Uh, countless times, all the time, we must choose what to do. We must act like our lives are filled with little choices and little actions. And as soon as we choose what to do and act on that decision, we will temporarily step out of this purely causal perspective on ourselves. Uh, because I can't just wait and see what I will be caused to do. If I just sit down and think to myself that, oh, I'm gonna wait and see what my neurotransmitters make me do next, then I will remain sitting and nothing's gonna happen. So this strict causal perspective on ourselves is something we can temporarily contemplate. And while we do that, feel a sort of release from guilt, but uh, it is not a stable self image that we can consistently stick to and thereby consistently have this guilt freedom. Uh, and uh, this is taking a little longer than I had planned. So I'm gonna go uh, a little faster now. Yeah, uh, okay. but, would, you, um, would you try to sort of finish in five minutes or so? Is yes, right? yes, that's, I, I can do that. So, okay, uh, <laughs> uh, and if that uh, recent argument you heard felt a little incomplete, uh, sorry, didn't plan uh, how long this would take, uh, properly. But anyway, so uh, I'm suggesting that it's much better to go so in a way uh, in the opposite direction, not take a step back from yourself and your experiences and memories and try to regard yourself as some kind of causal system where your brain colors or neurotransmitters or whatever just causes whatever you do in the end, but instead dive into your memories. So suppose I feel guilty. Uh, about um, way back dragging up people in the middle of the night, disturbing them, uh, sort of <laughs> demanding of them that they rescue me and it was really hard on them. Suppose I, I feel guilty about all this. Uh, I think that maybe I should have exerted more willpower and clung harder to, well, consensus reality. I should not have thought, screw this, I'm going mad because it felt too hard. Uh, and it might, it might be true that I could have, by exerting an enormous effort, uh, it might be true that I could have sort of just powered through <laughs> the feeling without, uh, and, and the fear of demons without uh, fleeing to a friend and dragging them up in the middle of the night. So suppose I, I feel guilty about this. Uh, but what I should do instead of just going, well, I couldn't help it because dopamine or something, is to really take seriously how afraid I was and how difficult it all was. And, you know, in some instances, it's possible that um, I am a little blameworthy for past behavior on that kind. Uh, as um, August Gorman talks about, uh, we should distribute burdens fairly. So maybe in some instances, I hurt my friends more than I would have hurt myself if I had exerted a bit more willpower and stayed put. But in other instances, I might be fully excused because this was so hard for me, uh, but I should take my difficulties and my struggles seriously. Uh, I had a really hard time. I should cut myself some slack, maybe lots of slack. And this is different from just going this 
objectifying exempting route. Uh, and I think the fact that this perspective often will lead us to deem that we had more or less diminished responsibility, responsibility rather than being 100% non-responsible is a feature and not a bug. It leaves room for nuance and self-improvement. And I think it's also crucial here to find a balance between being too harsh on yourself and too exculpatory uh, about your previous actions. Uh, and philosophers like Robin Dillon and Christine Korsgaard have written about the importance of finding such a balance, uh, neither being too harsh on yourself for past wrongdoings, nor uh, being too ready to let yourself off the hook for everything uh, in a general way. But I think this is really important when you're mad as well. And then just a final note, and this was also prompted um, by August Gorman, the fact that I added this, but there are a lot of things that people with madness or some kind of neurodiversity are habitually blamed for just because it's considered weird behavior, even though it's completely harmless. And it's easy to forget when we discuss uh, moral responsibility and exemption of mad people that uh, the question of whether to blame or not does not only come up for actions that are actually wrongful or harmful in some way. Mad people and also neuroatypical people are blamed all the time for stuff that's completely harmless just because it's considered weird. And this is something we should just stop doing. And that was the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sophia. Um... It's a very interesting talk, a very interesting perspective as well. I think uh, uh, a much needed one. Uh, and I was reminded of my how I started out my academic career once by writing a, a damning review of a, uh, a Dutch book. Maureen will know the, the person, I think. It was Antoine Moy. He wrote a book about uh, psychoanalysis and uh, well, was, you know he wrote plenty of books about I, I can't remember what it was what it was about particularly but it was he was all, always talking about responsibility in the context of uh, clinical care for patients and I got really mad at him like for talking about even suggesting that there would be some kind of responsibility we could uh, attribute to uh, to to uh, people suffering from mental illnesses. Uh, but now I think I should reread that book, actually, <laughs> <laughs> upon hearing your talk. Anyway, thank you. Um, and uh, so plenty of questions. Um, I can't remember who was first, but uh, I'll, I'll give uh, Maureen uh, the floor first. Thank you. That's kind, <laughs> Peter. Uh, Sophie, thank you so much. That was really a wonderful, wonderful talk. I'm, I'm so sorry that I didn't come up after you instead of before you because that would have made my job I think so much easier to uh, to make clear what I wanted to say so I don't want to hijack your your talk I just uh, I but I do have a question which is inspired by my own by my own talk and that's um, your talk about the guilt 